This is a lovely looking sweater. It's one of my most favorited projects in Ravelry. And yet, when you look at the project page in Ravelry, the first line of the comments reads, I made a mistake. How did I make a mistake? I chose the wrong yarn. That's the second line. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about yarn substitution. In other words, how to choose a yarn for a project that is not the yarn that's called for in the pattern. Yes, it's going to involve swatching 100%. <laughs> So, if you're interested in finding out how I made this mistake, why I made this mistake, and how I will never make this mistake again, follow me into the Maker's Lounge and let's get after yarn substitution. Okay, you've got a pattern that you're dying to knit and you know what yarn it calls for and you absolutely love the design, you love everything about it, maybe you love the color, maybe you, you just love the way it drapes, you love the fit, you love everything. If you want your project to turn out exactly like the project you're seeing in that hero shot in the pattern, <laughs> here's what you're gonna do. You're going to use the exact same yarn that the designer used and is called for in the pattern, period. If you want your project to be exactly the way it is in the pattern, you need to use the exact same yarn. That project was designed using a particular yarn for particular reasons, and if you don't use the exact same yarn, you may not end up with something that you love as much as you love that project and why you chose it. Okay, now, having said that, <laughs> there are going to be lots of reasons why you maybe um, can't or don't want to use the yarn that the pattern calls for. Um, maybe it's too expensive, which is totally legit. Designers often have pretty you know, severe champagne taste in yarns and or they get sponsored by yarn companies and are given the yarns or there's lots of reasons why they choose to use the yarns that they do, but they often can be on the pricey side. So maybe you just plain can't afford it and you need a choice that's more affordable. Maybe you can't get that yarn anymore. The pattern's a few years old and the yarn has been discontinued. Common issue. Or Maybe you want to use some yarn that's in your stash. You've got lots of sweater quantities of yarn and you just want to use up something that you have on hand and get knitting. All of these are perfectly legit reasons for wanting to swap out the yarn of choice. Um, it, there are more reasons, but these are, you know, three kind of significant ones and all of which are reasons I've swapped out yarns in a pattern before. I've uh, encountered every single one of those scenarios. <laughs> so let's say that we are going to change the yarn just because for because we're going to. So now what do we do to make sure that we get a project that looks like the one in the pattern and is what we want to knit? Or it will, will be a finished project that we want um, to wear and we'll be happy with. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn the rules like a master so that we can break them like an artist. <laughs> okay? Because the reality is you can knit anything with any yarn you darn well choose. <laughs> the only thing that's going to make a difference is how that project turns out and if you're going to get the project that you actually want. Okay? So that's the name of the game here is we want to make sure that we're getting the outcome that we want by doing a little leg, leg work up front and making sure we're making the right yarn choice. Let's look at the, the properties of a yarn because if you want your project to turn out the way you want it to turn out, then what you want to do is you want to use a yarn that it has as close to the same properties as the yarn the designer used as possible. And there's a whole list of properties that we're going to look at. Um, and as we're doing that, we will 
you know, we'll talk about what went wrong with my stone cutter cardigan in the process. So you have a live example, something we can relate to as we go. Um, so the first thing is obviously the weight. So if the pattern calls for a DK weight yarn, then chances are pretty good that you're going to want to substitute it with another DK weight yarn. But the thing to keep in mind is not all yarn weights are created equal. So just because a yarn calls itself fingering or DK or worsted or Aran or bulky does not mean that it is going to knit up exactly the same as every other DK worsted fingering <laughs> bulky <laughs> Aaron uh, in that same grouping. There's a big range of weights and properties that can change how a yarn knits up and it does not mean that they knit to exactly the same gauge. So they're in, they'll be in a range in the gauge. So the weight dictates the gauge, generally speaking. We're all pretty familiar with that by this point, right? So a DK weight yarn, for instance, is generally speaking going to knit up at say 22 to 24 stitches per four inches and usually on a four millimeter needle, which is I believe a six in US sizing. Sorry, you'll have to forgive me and my lack of knowledge of US sizing because I'm a millimeters gal. <laughs> Born and raised in Canada at a time when good old metric system came into play. <laughs> and millimeters are what I know. Uh, but I will try to keep in mind that a lot of my audience is uh, not metric. So I'm doing my best, folks. Um, feel free to correct me if I'm mistaken. <laughs> anyway, moving along. So we're going to try to choose the right weight. And that might be where we start in, in our yarn substitution selection. And that of course leads us into gauge, which we just talked about. So we want to choose a yarn that we're pretty sure is going to knit up to the same gauge. So same weight will knit up to the same gauge. If you look at the information on the yarn ball where it tells you, um, for instance, this yarn I have in my hand calls itself an Aran. And it says it knits up at 16 to 20 stitches per four inches on a 4.5 to 5.5 or US 7 to 9 um, needle. Okay, that's a pretty big range. Like there's a big difference between 16 stitches and 20 stitches. That's four stitches per inch or five stitches per inch. That's gonna make a huge difference over a garment four and a half millimeter needles to five and a half millimeters of size nine, seven to size nine. That's a big difference in the size of a needle. There's a lot of variation there. We're going to have to swatch. Swatch, 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 swatch. Uh, if you need a refresher in swatching, here's a link to my swatching tutorial from last week to remind you best practices for swatching. There's no way around swatching if you're going to yarn substitute. There, there just isn't, not if you care about the outcome, which I know you do. Okay, so moving on, we want something that's gonna match the gauge, so we're hoping that the information on the yarn ball of the yarn that you're swapping out um, is pretty close to the information that would be on the yarn ball for the yarn the designer used. You can usually find that information out by just Googling the yarn, and you should be able to get the information by Googling the yarn about its expected gauge, the needle size, kind of general information about it. Um, what its fiber content is, all that kind of stuff, because we're gonna wanna match all these things. There's a website that I use a fair bit called yarnsub.com, and of course I will put a link down below uh, for you to to go check it out but it is super helpful you just put in the yarn there's a it's a very simple website there's a box you enter the yarn you want to substitute and it will spit out a whole list of yarns for you that are very similar even with percentage matches 
to the one that you're looking for. And that, um, that website really helps with making sure you're getting the same kind of properties in your yarn, same gauge, same fiber content, same other properties. So go check that out. I use it a lot. Um, okay, so the next thing while we're on fiber content is we w again we want to try and match the fiber content if we can. Now, one of the reasons that you might be swapping out a yarn is that you can't wear wool or you can't wear mohair. Like I can't wear mohair, it um, makes me crazy. It just makes me itch. Even looking at it makes me itch a little bit. Uh, so you'll want to, um, you might not be able to, to do this, but it's, it's, you're really going to have to swatch and try a bunch of different things and really look closely at those yarn properties. If you're going to change the fiber content from an animal fiber to a plant-based fiber or a synthetic fiber, because all of those things will behave quite differently. So if the garment was designed for a nice springy wool, like a bouncy, bouncy, springy, smooth, high stitch definition wool, and you swap it out for something that is not bouncy, bouncy, springy, and high stitch definition, you are going to get a different result. Ask me how I know. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> so this stonecutter sweater was designed with a uh, wool, mohair, and a tiny bit of angora blend yarn. So it was meant to be um, pretty bouncy and springy. And what I knitted out of is not bouncy and springy at all. It is a 50% merino wool, 50% alpaca blend. So yes, it's lovely and soft and it has a bit of a halo. Um, the the yarn and the pattern, even though it's got, you know, like 30 um, percent or 30-ish percent mohair and a bit of angora, doesn't have a lot of a halo. You can see uh, the stitch definition in this picture. It's a pretty crisp stiff de stitch definition. My fuzzy soft alpaca does not have that kind of stitch definition. And not only does it not have stitch definition, but let's now move into talking about yarn texture because that's a big issue with why I say that I knit this with the wrong yarn. So there's a bunch of things that are involved in texture and one of them is, is your yarn worsted spun, which means it's smooth and a fairly tight twist and usual, usually um, three or more plies together to make a nice round smooth yarn or is it woolen spun where it's less smooth and really fuzzy and has a lot of those toothy little woolly um, pokey ends and halos and things all still sticking out of it, right? So there's there's that. What is the texture of the yarn? An alpaca yarn has a bit of a halo. It tends to be shiny and it tends to be quite drapey and does not have the elasticity of a nice crimped toothy wool. So what happens here with this guy is it's heavy. Okay, it's it's gristier <laughs> than, um, than the yarn that this particular pattern called for. And what's grist, you ask? What the hell are you talking about, Nicole? What's grist? So grist is the amount of meterage or yardage you get per ounce or per gram. Okay, So you can actually take the amount of yardage in a ball and divide it by the weight and you'll get a number that gives you a sense of the grist. And I'll just give you an example. It's kind of the, it's like the density of that yarn. So I've got two sweaters here, just to show you how grist works. Okay, two sweaters. They're both full size pullover um, sweaters knit in approximately the same gauge of yarn. 
This one is quite light. It weighs less than a pound. And this one weighs more than 50% more than this sweater of the same size. When I hold them in my hand, I can really feel. I have to work harder to hold this blue one up than I do this guy. This is kind of um, a light woolen spun, soft, grippy, grabby, woolly kind of yarn. This is a very dense, high stitch definition, highly twisted, uh, worsted spun yarn. And I mean, when I say worsted spun, I don't mean worsted weight. I, and I know how confusing this is, but that's a completely different thing. Worsted spun talks about, is the texture of the yarn. It's how it was spun, and if it's nice and tightly spun and smooth, or is it more loosely spun and lighter and loftier? Okay, so that's the grist. So you're going to end up, and maybe, you know, maybe you're okay with this, but you are going to end up with a different sweater if you choose a yarn that's quite gristy compared to a yarn that's light and lofty and fluffy. And you can tell pretty quickly about the grist of a yarn by looking at the amount of meterage for the weight of the yarn. The more meter, meterage there is in, say, 100 grams, the less grist that yarn is going to have. The, the less meterage there is in 100 grams, the more grist that yarn has. It's, it's heavy, it's dense, it's, it's heavy, <laughs> okay? It's dense. <laughs> it's going to give you a different outcome. So this is a heavy kind of floopy, um, alpaca blend, um, which isn't really what this cardigan was designed for. This cardigan has a ton of stitch texture, and stitch texture adds more stitches into a compact area and makes um, fabric more dense automatically just by putting that texture in because when you're crossing stitches over each other, right, you've got a double layer all of a sudden, um, you've got a lot of ribbing and stitch texture and there's just more stitches packed into the same amount of space so the gristier your yarn is you're adding more weight again to that and the whole thing starts to get pretty um, pretty weighty and heavy and drape drapes a lot um, this sweater really doesn't warrant this kind of drape like it's okay it's okay but it's not what was intended for a you know textured kind of light throw it on zip it up and go out into the world uh, fall cardigan so there's that the other thing about the texture is that the alpaca well nice and soft and halo-y pills like crazy <laughs> so every time I wear the sweater and you know, this is part of durability when we talk about uh, elasticity and durability. So we already know there's a lot of drape here. There's very little elasticity and it's not particularly durable um, because alpaca is just meant to be soft and drapey and pretty. And it's not really designed for hard wear. Um, it's great for hats um, to a certain extent for mitts. Um, for cowls, for shawls, for things that aren't getting a lot of abrasion. This guy, every time I wear it, the underarms rub against the sides, as things do when you wear them, and it just pills like crazy. I can't pull this out of my closet without have, having to get out the gleaner and spending like five or ten minutes getting all the pills off it before I can wear it again. So, you know, it looks good in a picture, but it's not a very practical sweater. I don't want a sweater that I have to um, that I have to fix every time before I can wear it, or it just doesn't look very nice. Okay, so that's another big reason why I say I picked the wrong yarn when I made this very lovely sweater. Then 
Another property that we want to look at is warmth. And the wool mohair blend, yes, is going to be warm, but alpaca, this one is 50% alpaca, and alpaca is known for being warmer than wool. Did you hear that? Alpaca is warmer than wool. So if I'm taking a nice warm merino wool and I'm adding, you know, 50% alpaca, I'm making it warmer still. And then I'm doing a heavily textured pattern where I'm piling stitches on top of each other to make a cool texture. I'm, I'm making like, a, um, what do you call it? Like a, a hazmat, not a hazmat suit, but like, <laughs> I'm making something so dense and warm that I can barely stand it. Like, um, uh, even if I wear just this, once I get outside and I get walking, I'm too hot really quickly. Uh, it's just overly warm for me, for somebody else, all that warmth might be great. You want as much warmth as you can pos possibly get and you don't mind the drape and you don't mind having to defuzz it every time you wear it, then by all means, choose that alpaca blend yarn for your sweater. Um, but for me, it's just too darn warm. And I've made this mistake with alpaca before. Um, I used to choose alpaca quite a bit for my sweaters because it's softer and I thought it's not going to bug me as much as regular wool, but I was not paying close enough attention to the properties of alpaca compared to the properties of the wool that was being that was designed for in the pattern I was knitting. Okay, so should we go over that again? Weight, gauge, fiber content, texture, drape, elasticity, durability, and warmth. And I had a number of those things in the yarn that I used here that did not match up with the yarn that this pattern was intended for. So sadly, it's a sweater that I have and I love the color of and I love the design of and I don't wear. Okay, but now we all know better to not do that again. Now, I just wanna give you one more example before we move on. Um, let's look at a pattern that we're all familiar with. Let's look at, well, I say we're all familiar with, many folks are familiar with, Tin Can Notes, The Love Note. It's been knit tens of thousands of times. <laughs> if you go to Ravelry and take a look at the projects, it's been knit a lot. I just happen to have the exact yarn that Love Note called for, calls for on hand. So I can show you an example of um, exactly the yarn the pattern called for. And yes, I'm wearing a love note and no, it, this is not knit in exactly the same yarn. This is knit in a different yarn, but we'll get to that in a minute. So love note calls for a fingering weight yarn plus a strand of mohair silk blend held together to create this very halo-y, look at all that fuzz, Halo-y, soft, super light, um, lustrous looking squish of a cloud. Okay, and the lace pattern in Love Note is very open. You see how big and open those stitches are? So that big open lace pattern looks much better when there's a, a nice halo to fill in all this space. This pattern is knit at a gauge of 16 stitches to four inches. 16 st stitches to four inches. That's like an Aran or bulky weight, really, okay? But we're using two very fine weight yarns held together and knitting them on a really big needle to create this kind of unusual type of fabric. In the pattern, Tin Can Knits uh, 
says that these two yarns together are the equivalent of a DK weight yarn. And as I said earlier, a DK weight yarn is normally knit on a four and a half millimeter needle. These are six millimeter needles. So we are taking a yarn out of its weight range and gauge range and doing something different with it. And the reason that it works in a love note is because of the two yarns held together with that fuzzy halo filling in all that extra space. Okay, that's how come this works. If I just chose a random DK weight yarn out of my stash, which I did, <laughs> and knit another swatch, okay, at first glance, it doesn't look too bad. This is this is a very uh, gristy and very smooth and very tightly wound merino, 100% merino wool. No halo, none whatsoever. Smooth as smooth as can be. Okay, and you can see every strand of that opening of that lace work. It's very very open. And it doesn't look too terrible. This is knit. So I knit this, this DK weight on this six millimeter needle. And yes, I did get a gauge of 16 stitches to four inches. And it doesn't look awful. You'd have to wear something underneath it because it's quite open, but that is really the case with any love note knit in the yarn that it calls for. That's not to say that people haven't substituted all kinds of things in love note. So um, it looks okay just hanging here, but I will tell you that this fabric is not great. Um, it does not have really great um, spring back. The elasticity is not good. Okay, because it's been knit so openly, uh, it's kind of flimsy. I would say this is flimsy fabric. It's not going to last very long. It's going to wear very poorly. Uh, it's it's not going to sit well on the body. It's just like it's just like a bit of a limp dish rag. It is not the lush, weighty, um, delicious cloud of a beauty that this blend is. It's just kind of whoops, <laughs> as I drop it. It's just kind of limp dish rag and it looks okay and I could probably wear it a couple of times um, but it would really start to look crappy pretty quickly and I'd be finding myself having to kind of re-block it every time to get it looking good again. This just does not make good fabric. So even though the pattern says that you can use the equivalent of any, you know, the DK DK weight equivalent, um, it doesn't really work out for this pattern all that well. So this one isn't the best choice for a substitution for Love Note, um, but I did need to substitute something because I can't wear the mohair that is in here. Ah, ah, I can't wear it. <laughs> So <laughs> what did I do? Because I wanted a fabric as similar to this as I could get without using the mohair. So what I used for this one is a strand of fingering weight yarn blended together with a strand of lace weight cashmere. The cashmere is not quite as fuzzy as a very fuzzy mohair um, silk blend or straight up mohair would be, but it had enough of a halo. It brought enough of a halo to this um, to have the same sort of effect of filling in that. Um, oh, where's my swatch? Well, I showed you my swatch when we did swatches last week, remember? Um, it had the same effect of, of filling in that super open lace work and uh, giving it that soft, fuzzy, light, um, wearable cloud feel 
that the original love note would have had. So this is why, you know, you can't just take the pattern's word for it. You need to take that yarn, you need to swatch it, and ideally you're going to swatch it at its own gauge, especially if you're doing a pattern like this, where it's being knit at, a, at an unusual gauge, which this is, for the weight of the yarn. You definitely want to test your yarn, your your new yarn, your substituted yarn, to make sure that you're going to get the fabric you want. So you might even want to swatch it at its own gauge first and see what that fabric is like. So um, you might take, if you're going to substitute a DK weight yarn for Love Note, um, take it, knit it on a four millimeter needle and see what kind of gauge and fabric you get. Then swatch it again on the six millimeter needle and see what kind of gauge and fabric you get. And then, again, make sure that you test out the lace part and make sure that you like the look of the lace in the yarn that you've chosen, because you might not. This lace does not look like this lace. They have a very different look to them. So you may not be happy with your end result when you try that. And don't forget, Love Note is knit in the round. Those swatches have to be done in the round. Okay, I did a speed swatching method. I will leave the link again down below, but you can always go back to last week's tutorial and check that out. Okay, so there we have it. The rules are, rule number one, use the yarn that the designer used in the pattern if you can. If you can't, or if you don't want to, all good. Rule number two, use a yarn with as close to the same properties as possible to the yarn that the designer used. Use your resources, Google the yarn in the pattern and see what it's all about and try to find something as close as you can in your stash or elsewhere. Use yarn sub to find close matches and swatch, 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 and swatch. <laughs> okay, all good? Clear as mud? <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thanks for joining me today. Um, if you learned anything today about yarn substitution or you found this helpful, um, it'd be really great for me if you can click on that thumbs up like button, um, leave a comment if you got anything to say, anything at all, <laughs> ask me a question. <laughs> it's all good. And uh, subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. And I will be back with you next week for episode nine of the podcast, wherein I show you all things new and exciting in Nicole Nitz Under the Influence podcast land. Okay, and then after that, we'll have another, uh, another tutorial. So hope you enjoyed this and look forward to seeing you soon. Thumbs up. Happy knitting.